the Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. He is my good buddy from up north, fellow entrepreneur and car enthusiast, Rich Cooper. Rich, welcome back to the show, my friend. Hey, George, thanks for having me again. So let's talk about your background in entrepreneurship. Uh, a lot of the interviews I do is about macro and inflation, mm -hmm. what's going on with the Fed and quantitative easing or quantitative tightening. But this channel is also about entrepreneurship. Uh, that's kind of my background before I retired in 2012. And mm -hmm. I know that's your background and you have been a fantastic entrepreneur for a long, long time. So kind of give us your background and then let's see if we can dive into a conversation that will give value yeah, to any of my listeners who are thinking about becoming an entrepreneur or are an entrepreneur right now and want to take it to the next level. Yeah. Like one of the things that you talk a lot about, and I've, I've watched a lot of your content now, George, is that, you know, you're always talking about the situation that's going on around us that most of us t have to unplug from, you know, it's like, they've been lying to you. They're not telling you the truth. Here's what I see. And then, I mean, you kind of do what I do, but I mean, you unplug them from a matrix, you know, when it comes to economics. And I've seen you talk about a lot of topics around that. And I think that, you know, um, if you're a guy today, guy or gal even, um, and you want like autonomy, you want control of your life and freedom. And um, there's a business ac acronym that Joe Polish um, coined well over a decade ago during his I Love Marketing podcast. He called it an elf business, easy, lucrative and fun. Um, versus a half business, which stands for hard, hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's very attractive to become an entrepreneur today. It's very sexy. Um, they've done studies and collected data on swiping apps, even like Tinder, you know, a few years back determined that if you put entrepreneur in your bio, the chances you get and swipe right on is actually higher. Hmm. So there's a lot of people that are interested in doing it. It's just, they generally do it wrong. And if you want that, that freedom, like, you're in Colombia right now. I'm in a part of the world where I can basically do this anywhere else as long as Mr. Trudeau lets me travel. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in jail right now. I mean, for my get out of jail free pass, I'm still a pure. Right, right. I'm going to figure that out later. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, you want to be able to structure your business in such a way that you can run it and do it from anywhere. It's lucrative. It's profitable. It's serving you. It's, you know, it's filling your cup. It's not draining your batteries. And it's something that, you know, that you're world class at basically like you're, you're world class at, taking information, aggregating it, distilling it, sanitizing it, and getting it right down to the point to your audience and, and explain it in, in such a way that pretty much anybody with even like a grade five or six education could get, right? And that's one of the things that I think that most of your audience, you know, has come to appreciate about you. I'm the same way when it comes to the topics, you know, when I talk about, you know, like in my book, like the Unplugged Alpha, when I unplug guys from, from the lies that they've been sold around relationships and women and stuff right, like that. Right. And essentially what I've done with this course with, with entrepreneurship is I've taken everything that I've learned over the last 20 years, personally dealing with business groups. I've put in like over a quarter million dollars attending events and masterminds and retreats and stuff like that. And I've just, again, sanitized it down, distilled it down to the most useful points. And I talk about what it is that you want to do if you want to run a successful business versus the stuff that you need to stay away from if you want to have an easy, lucrative, and fun life running a business. Because believe it or not, what, nine times out of 10, a business is going to fail within the first few years. But the stat that most people don't hear is that about 97% of businesses that are still running after the first few years are not making more than a million dollars a year in sales. Mm -hmm. And all the person's done is they've traded an expertise in an area that, that they were good at, you know, as an employee created a business with those skills, employed themselves. So now they're self-employed and now they have more exposure to risk lawsuits. They have employee issues. They have tax liabilities. They have all these things that come, you know, with responsibility of running a business. And why would you do that? Why would you expose yourself to unnecessary risk? And you think bigger. And those are the sorts of things that I talk about. Can you go through your background, Rich, like w where you started, you'd, yeah. I, I know it's a fascinating story. And where should I, we go to to like to like the teenage years or, we, yeah, or well, should we go to when my boss wanted to throw me out of the company when I was 30? No, I mean I think prior to that, how you got involved with the the first business you started, which I yeah. think was uh 2003, that was my kind of rehabbing business. people's credit. Mm -hmm. And uh I think it's if my memory serves me right, you kind of started in that business as an employee and then kind of figured it out. And no, then actually 
Actually, I was an employee in credit, credit and collection. So Equifax okay. is a name that, you know, the, the world is pretty much, you know, familiar with. It's the largest credit reporting agency. But what most people don't know is they, they own um, various branches and arms of collections because that's also a fairly lucrative business as well. So I spent about 10 years in the credit and, and collections world. Mm, Red right. tape, corporate BS. There's a glass ceiling. Somebody gets promoted because they're buddies, you know, with the president or the vice president. You get cast aside. All those things, you know, everybody that's lived through that at some point knows what that feels like. Except for me, I didn't quit. They gave me a package. And that's when I learned that they hire you for your fit, for your resume, you know, for your skills and what you can do. But they'll fire you based on, sorry, they hire you for your resume, but they'll fire you because of your fit. And I got canned because they had some corporate restructuring from the head office and they wanted to cut a manager's uh, paycheck off of uh, payroll. And they sent me home with like $15,000 and I was about 30 at the time. Mm. Just bought my first house, um, had a mortgage to deal with, had about seven or eight months worth of cash to deal with. When I was a kid, I'd always hustle. Like my parents would never give me an allowance. So I had to run a paper route. I would shovel driveways. I would cut people's grass. Uh, even with the paper route, I would even contract out to friends so they would do some work for me and I would collect on top of that. I would return bottles to stores. So um, I think when I was 16, I had a mobile car washing business. So I used to go to dealerships, pick up the cars, bring them home, wash them, and then you know drop them off. So I was always hustling to make some kind of money. Yeah. So when I hit 30, it was like either go work for another bunch of jackasses that were going to probably you know end the same way or let me lean back into something that I really feel that I needed to do, which was start a business, which, which is what I did at the time is I essentially figured out how to connect debtors with creditors, but have the debtors pay less than half of what they owe with the settlement back to the creditors. They would take it as a full payment right off the difference and call it a day. Hmm. And I ran that for 15 years, you know, as the founder and CEO, and I did an earn out buyout with my brother a few years ago. And now he takes care of the company and I just sit on the board and do some advising work. How did you start that business? I mean, it, it, take us from, because I think this is part of it that most people don't grasp. You know, when you take it from an idea to an actual, I mean, what I used to do is, I mean, we would have an idea and then you got to go lease a space. You, know, you get a 10 year lease or whatever, then you got to set up the phone lines. I actually had a call center with uh, 40 seats prior to retiring, which was part of uh, an existing business. And it would just take inbound call, inbound marketing calls for, yeah. for the one business I had. And uh, so there's, there's a long process and you're just constantly spending money and you're not able to make any. And you're just constantly spending money with the hopes of having a return somewhere down the line. But it, it, it's just incredible risk. And I, I was wondering if it was the same uh, process that you had when you're starting a brick and mortar location. And then yeah. I want to set that up for people to juxtapose that to types of businesses they can set up today, which you and I now have that require none of that. Yeah, you don't. I mean, you know, the gatekeepers are pretty much gone. Um, I started up my debt relief business at a time when um, MySpace, Google, and YouTube was just in its infancy. Yeah, and I actually started most of my um, marketing strategies just calling up mortgage agents and saying, "Hey, guys, you know, you have," or I would try to get a hold of the broker. And you know, if they had like fifteen or twenty agents under them, then that would be an ideal target for me. Because so cold calling. Yeah. So I just cold call and be like, look, you know, I have a way for you guys to close more mortgage deals. Um, if you have a guy that's approaching you for credit card, you know, consolidation and they've got 60 grand in debt, but you can only get them a second mortgage for 40 or 50,000. I can now make that deal fit. You can now fund it, earn your money. And I'll even pay you a little bit of a kickback, you know, with a um, affiliate fee or like a commission for that referral. Right. So that's how I started running it for the first few years. And I made a profit pretty much from month one, the way that I structured it. Like I've, I've always had a knack for making money. Like even when I was a kid, I always had a knack for making money when it came to like, you know, hustling and doing the work. Cause I like to work hard to get things done. And I think that one of the skills you have to have as an entrepreneur that a lot of guys lack is innovative thinking. Like there's inside of the box thinking, there's outside of the box thinking. And then there's a the kind of thinking that guys like Steve Jobs would use, which is not even seeing the box kind of thinking. Right. And you have to be really good at, at, at problem solving because that's all running a business is. I mean, like, you know, like, like it's just a series of stuff that comes your way all day long. And yeah. you're like, you know, you're putting out some fires sometimes, sometimes it's a forest fire, sometimes it's nothing and you've got an easy day or week, but you have to be really good at solving problems. And 
adapting uh, solutions from other industries as well. Like one of the things that I often talk about is an acronym, which is R&D, which most people think stands for research and development, but it stands for rip off and duplicate. And it's like, if I have a problem, but I see a solution in another industry, I can just unplug that and, you know, apply it to my business. So as an example, you know, to your point of like how I started the business and how I got it running, a lot of the mortgage agents would start to like, R&D what I was doing and they would rip off and duplicate, you know, the settlement process because they thought, right. you know, thought they were good at it. A lot of them screwed it up and I had to fix things for them afterwards, but I got tired of sourcing my customers through mortgage agents and I wanted to figure out a way to go directly to the customer. And this was around the time when pay-per-click marketing just popped out with Google around 2004, five, six or so. Yeah. We have a very similar timeline, Rich. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's when I really started kind of getting involved. That's when I really started making a little bit of a mon money as an entrepreneur. And I think you and I are about the same age too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that was around the time when I needed software, right? So it's like, well, there was no software that existed in Canada to solve the problem that I had, but I found an American, actually it was a Russian guy that was living down in Florida that was writing code for US debt negotiation companies. And I paid him a little bit of extra money to uh, customize it to the Canadian marketplace, R&D that brought it into Canada and started using that. And what that did with that was that allowed us, instead of dealing with the mortgage agents for the source of funding to settle the debt, the customer could now pay into a fund where they were basically self-funding their own settlements. So we didn't need the mortgage agents. We didn't need financing or anything with an outside source. I could deal directly with my customer. The other thing that was happening too, when I was dealing with the mortgage agents is I got ripped off a couple of times, meaning I would do work for a month and then it would come time to get paid. And then you had some um, underhanded behavior where they would refuse to pay you because they already just took the settlements and ran off with it and they didn't want to pay you sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I solved that problem as well. The pay-per-click marketing was phenomenal because at that time, to, today, I think the acquisition rate's something like 40 or $50, um, you know, to acquire a lead. Back when I first started doing it, there was, there was several years where I could get a lead for a few dollars, like three, four, yeah. five, six dollars, you know, sort right. of thing. And I remember having like phone calls with my accountant calling him up like, I've got a hundred thousand dollars cash, like extra this month. What am I supposed to do with it? Like, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, that's when you start having some conversations about, okay, well, how do you minimize your tax liabilities? And, yeah. you know, and I talk about stuff like that in my course too, like when you want an accountant in your business and when you want to deal with lawyers and stuff like that. Yeah. Let, let's go down that path a little bit because I see so many people that are aspiring entrepreneurs and they're a little bit like aspiring real estate investors. Yeah. And I don't know if you've seen these types of people like at a, at a local real estate, uh, RIA, I think they're called in the United States with these meetups. And these people have been thinking about setting up a, a business or thinking about investing in real estate for like three, four five years. And mm -hmm. they've got all the LLCs set up and they've got the, the bank account set up and they've got their a lawyer and their accountant and they've got all these people. Yeah. And it's just, they, they get the paralysis of analysis and they get all this money dropped on all these things that really at the end of the day, don't even make any money or, or don't really matter. Uh, and they haven't even lifted up the phone to make a cold call yet. Yeah, And, uh, you know, I, I, that's such a huge problem for people where I have found in my own business experience that it's far better to um, shoot first and ask questions later uh, and just take action, get off the couch, do something. Don't worry about the taxes. Don't worry about, uh, you know, all of the LLC structures and the bank yep. accounts. Just take action for heaven's sakes. And I think that's what most people struggle with the most. Yeah, the whole point of a business, and people forget this, is to return a profit to its shareholder. And if you're the founder and the CEO of that business and you started it up, the whole point of it is to make you money. And far too many people will, I mean, you see this all the time on shows like Shark Tank and Dragon's Den and stuff like that. And they'll approach investors and they'll have like, they'll spend money on swag before they're making a profit, before they have customers. <laughs> they want branded pens and fucking notepads. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know, the weirdest things. And it's like, you know, you know, then the, then the investors will be like, cool. So like how many customers do you have and how much right. are you making monthly right now? It's like, well, none. I just want your money. Like they want somebody else to take the risk financially while they run around with no experience trying to make money off that guy's money sort of thing. And um, again, uh, you know, uh, like in a lot of the modules that I talk about in my course, you know, with the lectures, I specifically talk about the kinds of businesses that you can run that will make you money 
very early on, if not from month one, um, that are going to serve you a lot better. And it's, it's, it's going to apply skills that you have to something that's going to make you a lot more profit and give you the freedom to maneuver and do whatever it is that you want, wherever it is that you want. But again, you know, most people, because they think conventionally and they think within the box and they color, color within the lines, it's like, well, I have to found, find an accountant and how do I structure the business and I incorporate it? You know what I did? Like, I'll tell you the story. The, the first year that I was in business, I made, uh, I think it was $298,000 and it wasn't one, one year because I started the business in, in uh, February. So it was about 11 months. And I remember bringing my books and my statements to that accountant because you have to file your taxes. And I dropped it off and I came back and, you know, he came out for the meeting and with a stack of paper in his hand, yelling at me going, what the fuck were you thinking? And he slams it on the ground. And why did you do this? And why did you, I'm like, <laughs> look, my philosophy in life is ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Right. right? right. It's right. only year one Canada revenue agency. I'm pretty sure doesn't want to put me out of business. And that's when he cooled his jets. And he's like, yeah, you're right. I just, you know, I get mad when I see stru stuff structured like this because he's a bean counter accountants, yeah, right. you know, that's the way they think. And by the way, if you want a good accountant in your business, you want a guy that's going to approach it from the angle of cool. Well, you know, now that you're making money, now that you're doing things like this, like, you know, there's things that we need to do that are going to minimize your tax liabilities, maximize your profits and be aligned with what it is that you want to do. You want an accountant to ask you a question like, Hey, you know, what do you like doing with your spare time? You want an accountant that's going to want to have lunch with you that you can actually like have a conversation with beyond just what's structured in the business. So they understand who you are as a guy and how it is that you want to live your life. Like George Gammon is a guy that lives in the States, lives in South America, likes, you know, mobility. Um, I'm sure that your accountant understands that and has helped you structure your business in such a way that it helps facilitate that lifestyle, right? Like it's really important to have those conversations. Yeah. And it's also very important to find an accountant and a lawyer that always remember that they work for you Yeah, and not vice versa. Because yeah. as an aspiring entrepreneur, I guarantee you'll find accountants, most of them, and most lawyers, they, they're good at the beginning. And then all of a sudden, it turns into this relationship where it seems like you're working for them. Mm -hmm. and, and you need to constantly remind them that no, 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 it's, it's the other way around. Yeah, yeah, they will, you know, they will throw stuff at you to consume your day with nonsense. And, you know, to your point, George, you're absolutely right. Like I've had... Um, Accountants, you know, for example, try to burden me with basic bookkeeping tasks. And it's like, no, my, like I, like my billable rate, you know, by the hour I value at this number and I'm not yeah. doing it for $90. Like, let's just get a bookkeeper to push all this stuff. Like, what do you need to do? Do you have to have the come into my office? Like, how do you want to set this up? And you sort of structure it from them, but you don't want to get sucked into this vortex of doing like menial tasks that you're not world-class at and that you don't enjoy. Otherwise you're going to start, you know, living and working in a business that you're going to start to resent. Yeah. You know, another mistake that I see a lot of people make, I'd like to get your feedback on is everyone thinks that in order to make money as an entrepreneur, you have to have this brilliant idea that nobody's ever thought of before, Yeah. you know, and, and that, and once you get that idea, well, then you can't share it with anybody. You got to go out yeah. and get a patent and a trademark and you got to get a logo and your business the scarcity mindset and all of these things. And I always said, no, first of all, you don't understand that it's the idea isn't really what's important. It's the execution. Correct. It's the execution. And that yeah. takes action. And all of these things like a logo and a brand and all you're, you're going to iterate. Because mm -hmm. however long you take to figure out the perfect logo, I guarantee you after you start using it for three or four months, you'll change it Yeah. because something will be wrong. So why not just throw whatever you can up against a wall, just see what sticks, take action uh, like we were talking about before, but then realize that the magic is in the execution, not really the idea. 100%. It's, it's all execution. Everybody's got a, got a great idea. I can't like I've I've lost count of the amount of emails and DMs and people that have approached me over the years. I mean, the, like the title of my channel is Entrepreneurs in Cars. So people automatically assume that I want to invest in whatever bright idea they have. But you know, it, it's always here, I need you to look at this and then sign this NDA and do all this work. And it's like, you know, <laughs> who are you, random stranger that's trying to assign all these tasks to me? And you know, like, do you actually have customers and receivables? And it's always no, right? Like right, they right. want you to jump through all these hoops. Like, uh, buddy, no, you know, I don't work for you. Like, I'm sorry, but you know, I have fun with your idea. Yeah. Right? What would you say to people 
that uh, either have this vision that they aren't capable of being an entrepreneur, and maybe some people aren't. I'd yeah. love your feedback there. But then it, what would you say like the three most important skill sets someone needs to have to be a successful entrepreneur? Number one is problem solving, 100%. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. The number one skill you have to have to be successful at running a business, doesn't matter what kind of business it is, is you have to be a good problem solver. Um, and you also have to think outside of the box because most of the solutions that you're going to have to go for are not conventionally in existence. Like you might have to mash up a couple of ideas. You might have to take it from an industry that's similar, but dissimilar. Um, you have to be very, very creative. Like those would be the three main points, you know, I would say. Um, the, the biggest point though really is, is that mo most of the time, anybody that's starting up a business or currently running a business is doing it completely wrong. And the biggest mistake that I've seen them do is they think way too small. Like I did a uh, Twitter spaces uh, about an hour ago and I had a few guys call in and asking questions because the course is open for enrollment and I'm taking some Q and a on it sort of thing. Right. And it's like, you know, I got this guy talking about copywriting and um, I had another guy the other day that was talking about doing um, voiceover um, gigs on like Fiverr or whatever like that. And he was all excited about making $300 for it. And I said, well, how long would it take you to do that? And he said, well, three days. I'm like, you're talking about getting excited about making a hundred dollars a day, right? Like that's not entrepreneurship, right? To me, if you're not building something that has a potential to grow to over a million dollars a year in annual sales, you're not running something that's going to be sellable at some point, right? Because yeah, you're just you, you're starting a job. Yeah, you're starting a job. You're just doing something to employ yourself, which may or may not work for you, or may may or may not take care of your family. But I can promise you, like you're thinking anyway. So why think about running something that's going to make you half a million dollars a year when you can think about building something that's going to make you five million or ten or fifteen million dollars a year? You're thinking. Just think bigger. Think scalability. Think about building it in such a way that you can earn money while you're sleeping, right? And that's what I talk about in the course is, you know, the mindset that the most successful entrepreneurs use to build their businesses or to pivot their existing businesses, if they're not that profitable, what to do and what not to do. Yeah. You know, it's one of the biggest mistakes I made, Rich. When yeah. I, the last business I had when I retired, we had about a uh, hundred employees. A lot of them were part-time. We had about 24 million in annual sales. Mm -hmm. And that was doing business in pretty much every English speaking country on the planet earth. Mm -hmm. I, I grew the business to Australia, to Singapore, to the UK, uh, to all of these places outside of the United States. So my point there is at 24 million, if I would have stayed in the business, sure, we might have been able to push it up to maybe 30, mm -hmm. but th that's pretty much a, a cap on, on the business itself, unless you figure out all some different revenue streams and whatnot. That are there's also the, the contemplation of having a hundred employees versus being a company of one. Um, you know, so there's this, this new great, business model. So of this being, is a great point. This yeah, is a great so, point. Yeah. So there's but, this but new business me, model called the company that, of one. Yeah. yeah but ahead, let let me sorry. finish that one thought right there. Yeah. And um, I was working probably 60, 70 plus hours a week to build this business where to your point, I could have taken that exact same time and energy and used it to build a business that was infinitely scalable mm -hmm. or could have maxed out at a hundred million or 250 million. It would have been the exact same amount of time and energy. Yeah. And that was one of the, the, the big mistakes that I made. And that now talking to your further point, uh, you know, back when we were doing this, uh, you know, in, in the day, uh, you had to put out a lot of cash. It was a lot of time. It was a lot of energy and there was massive amounts of risks and then, you know, maybe you make a million bucks a year or something like that. You know, you net out a million to a year. But now what's f fascinating and, and really exciting is you can have a business online with three or four, five, 10 employees and make this, you might not make 24 million in gross, but you can make the same net with a fraction of the risk and the headache. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's, that's. That's a very, very important point because when people structure this, they're thinking bricks and mortar, signage, like they want that neon sign flashing on the front window of their office for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. I don't care about that stuff. Yeah. But signage, brick and mortars, employees, employee parties. And employees are, I mean, 
I hate to say this because I know a lot of people watching are probably employees watching this, but as an employer or as somebody that's going to run a business, they're not very efficient, right? Like there's been a lot of studies done on this. And if you ask an employee, you know, where the line in the sand is, where they need to start working, they're going to set it down over here because they'll just do as much as they feel that their compensation, um, you know, covers them to. Mm. The problem is, is most employers, they have, you know, there's a big gap, you know, most employers have an expectation that they do this much. So there's always, you know, they think, you know, as an employer, they should be doing this much. The employee thinks that they should be doing this much for what they're compensated for. And then there's all the other problems that come with, you know, having employees, they call in sick, they, you know, there's rainy days, there's snow days, they're, they're banging each other. There's HR issues, you know, they're complaining about stuff. You get sued. They, you know, they go on leave, they get injured. Like there's all kinds of problems that come along with it. Believe it or not, Today, with the way that the marketplace is and the way the economy is, you actually don't like I run a company of one, it's me and I have one contractor, mm. right? And I'm pulling about 7 million views a month right now. Um, I've got book sales. I've got a supplement line. I've got the podcast. I don't need much, you know, in my life. And I love it, man. It's way better than me having all those employees and the problems that I had before. I mean, there are ways, like, and and you know, there are ways to run employees very efficiently and effectively. And I did that too, right? Like I've done both ends of the spectrums. Like I got awards for company culture, and we used to give our employees like any time days off and extra vacation time. And I get all that stuff. Like there's ways to structure that, but I don't have to deal with any of that today. I just have to focus on what, what I have control of. And I can literally do this from anywhere in the world. Like if George said to me, Hey, you know, let's get together and, you know, chop up ideas for a couple of weeks in this country. And I wasn't a prisoner of Trudeau right now. I'm sure that's going to lift soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd be on a plane and be like, yeah, you know, let's go do it. And I could run the business from there as well too. So there's also your ability to maneuver, to incorporate yourself in uh, different tax, you know, jurisdictions, there might be um, you the opportunity to get passports and live in different places in the world. I mean, like one of my plans long-term, George, I know we've talked about this before is maybe I'll be on a sailboat in eight, nine, 10 years or so yeah, dealing with Starlink doing, you know, what I'm doing right now from a sailboat in different parts of the world, right? Like that would be cool too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I, I benefited from, back back in the day is i had a, a i hate to use the word mentor because it's so cliche but um one of the businesses that i actually ran i, I took it over from bankruptcy and i it was my job to go in there and turn it around and kind of get it profitable and flip it and the guy that i flipped it to ended up buying it uh, i stayed on and and worked for him as a consultant and he became someone that was very influential to me. And he really taught me a lot because this was back when I was probably, I don't know how old I would have been, maybe uh, 30 or 30, 31, something like that. And uh, he had been a, a CEO in Silicon Valley for quite some time. He was maybe you know 68 years old at the time. Hmm. So he was really able to reduce my learning curve on a, a lot of things. And, and back in those days, I'm sure you can relate, um, I was incredibly ambitious, but I had a, a horrible temper. I was, I was, I was good at managing people and uh, pushing. Well, I was good at getting the most out of people, but I would push them to their limits. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they would burn out mm -hmm. as, as a result. And he really helped me um, kind of understand that. One of the things that I always remember that to the, to this day, he said, George, sometimes you got to remind people that you're human. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said so many other things that made such a huge impact on the way I not only worked my business, but saw the world that helped me later on in life and, and still helped me to this day. But a lot of people don't have that. And so, I, I, you know, I, I kind of want to transition this into your course. And I, we haven't even talked about this, mm -hmm. but is it a course where it's just kind of a, a like a tutorial that just do this, this, and this, or is there more of that? This is what I have done in the past. And this is how you can use from my six. This is what you can take from my experiences, my, my failures and my successes to really reduce your learning curve, to make sure that you have the highest probability of success moving forward. Yeah, that's, um, it's definitely the latter. So um, like the course material with the lectures, there's about four hours worth of lectures. They're all organized in different categories. Uh, let me just roll down over here. 
Sure. Um, I mean, I basically call it the cheat codes to business. So it's a mindset course that helps you understand. So there's three mindset lectures, which kind of set the foundation. Then I talk about things like taxes, legal matters, insurance, the ideal kinds of businesses to run, uh, developing a network and how to do that government and regulations, because that will come at some point, especially when you get involved in certain parts of, of people's lives. Like if you're helping them improve their health, lose weight, um, if there's something to do financially, there's always government and regulation that's going to come your way. And it's across the board. It doesn't matter what country you live in. Uh, I talk about why borrowing money is generally dumb when you're starting up a business. Mm. I talk about human resources and uh, how to run employees versus run a company of one, uh, acquiring customers, building an audience and marketing. Um, I've spent a ton of money on marketing. I'm sure you did too. When you ran yeah. your call center, yeah. like my office was basically a call center too. And it's like today I, I spend $0 on marketing because I have an audience. Right. Um, so those are, those are really important things to contemplate. And I talk about why, uh, I talk sp specifically in one of the lectures about what absolutely not to do, how to pivot, um, when you need to pivot, cause we all have to pivot at some point in the business. You're a car guy. Do you know the story about Lamborghini? Yeah, it was a tractor. Yeah, it was a tractor company. So Lamborghini basically acquired tractors after the war, mm. uh, reverse engineered them, sold them, made some money, went to Enzo and said, I want to buy a Ferrari, but I think your transmission sucks. Uh, Enzo told him to pound sand and he said, fine, I'll just build a car to compete against you. And now Lamborghini is basically a supercar company that came out of spite. So yeah. most, most businesses pivot at some point, right? Like Instagram pivoted from being a check-in app uh, to a social media app with filters and pictures. Uh, Netflix pivoted from shipping DVDs in the mail to streaming services. Yeah. If you're not prepared to pivot and you don't pivot at the right time, you're going to be out of business. Um, I had to pivot my debt business uh, twice, 2006, when we went from mortgage agents to directly to consumer and 2015, when we, when we had to pivot and restructure it to turn into a law firm to deal with legislation. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. the last point is generating business ideas. So to your question, it's a mindset course. It's what the best do and what the best don't do. And it's for people that want to start a business, but they don't know how to start a business and what kind of business to start. It's also for people that are doing less than a million dollars a year and they hate their business. It's not making mm -hmm. the money. They're working too many hours. It's not profitable. It's not lucrative. Um, there's probably a, a pivot in there somewhere or things that you're going to have to change. And I think the course answers all of that. It comes with a private Facebook group. Uh, there's going to be monthly Zoom calls with webinars that I'm going to host. And I have some guest presentations as well. Yeah. You know, when you were saying that, it just reminded me of a, of a kind of a pivot that, that we had to do sort of in back in maybe 2003 or so, maybe it's 2004. And that, that's when the DNC came out. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? Do not I don't call know if they us. Had, yeah. Did they have that in Canada? Like they did. We do have a do not call list, but it doesn't work for anybody calling into uh, Canada from outside. But, and my phone rings off the hooks from people selling me duck cleaning from India or some nonsense like that. Like you can't get rid of them. Yeah. Back in the day with this one business I was working with, uh, that was our, our, our major so lead source was mm -hmm. just flat out cold calling. And I, I remember actually that one of these guys in the business that was really hardcore, he would literally rip out pages of the phone book and give it to his telemarketers with the script mm -hmm. and give the, I remember each little telemarketing station that he had, had the, the script, the little computer, the phone, and then like a couple sheets from the white pages and a, po <laughs> and a pot of coffee. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. You got to do what they, you got to do, right? Yeah. And then when they would get done with their sheet on the white pages, they'd go back to him and say, Hey, I, I need another sheet from, yeah. uh, you know, from the phone book. And he'd say, no, just make up, just make up numbers. So what they do <laughs> is they, let's say it was nine, eight, seven, five, two, zero, zero was the last number they called. Right. They just have to do five, two, zero, one. And so then they five, just do two, diff zero, different three. combinations of the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And, th and that was how th they generated that's how you got the numbers. Yeah. That's how they generated leads. And they had a multi-million dollar business as a result. But then when the DNC came out, yeah, that was gone. That now, was like instantly all of gone. That's so we had changed to today. pivot, you know? Yeah. All of that's changed today. There, there was a book that I read um, about 12 or 15 years ago. It's called Inbound Marketing. And I learned a lot from that book in structuring my business and even my personal life. I mean, you can structure your personal dating life in such a way that women will come to you, you know, if you know mm -hmm. how to put out the right breadcrumbs and uh, trails, you know, sort of thing. And 
I talk a lot about that in one of the modules as well as how to build a business in such a way that you have inbound marketing. So you're not ripping out pages of the phone book and having to call people and you're getting <laughs> legislated out of having to do that. I mean, the Red Baron said it the most eloquently, you know, who, who was um, Manfred von Richthofen, I think was his real name or whatever, but he had a strategy of rather than flying over into enemy territory, he always said it, it was far better to have your customers come to you. So he would fly up to altitude um, and then dive down on the enemy when they were over his territory from the sun so they couldn't see him. And he, that's how he racked up you know, such a huge kill count. So mm. having your customers come to you is a far better way to run your business. And that's one of the strategies that I talk about in one of the modules as well, too. Yeah. And then go if you could go back and kind of tell us the story of how you pivoted again uh, from kind of the brick and mortar uh, credit uh, reconstruction business to what you're doing now, because, it, it, and I don't know this whole story, mm -hmm. but just from me following your content, it seems like you started your YouTube channel pretty much to talk about just entrepreneurial stuff and kind of, you know, your, your daily life and what you're doing as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, your, your enthusiasm with cars, but then, you know, you kept pivoting there as well. And it's yeah. the exact same thing that I did with my YouTube channel when I set it up is, uh, you know, my passion really was macroeconomics. Yeah. But I didn't think that anyone in their right mind would ever want to watch a video on the, the Fed's balance sheet. Yeah. So I started doing real estate videos thinking, well, I like that too. And, uh, you know, this is most likely what people want to watch. But then what happened is the whiteboard videos I did on macro became very, very popular. So I iterate and it just worked great for both parties. But it's this continual iterative process that you have to be okay with. And I think most people, they get stuck in a rut that this is the plan, this is the plan, this is the plan, this is the plan. Mm -hmm. And it and it doesn't allow them to, to venture outside of that, off those train tracks, let's say. And I think your personal story illustrates that well. Yeah, I, I, I started the channel and I called it Entrepreneurs in Cars, May 23rd, 2014. I was leaving a retreat with a bunch of entrepreneurs. And, you know, we basically were planning our next year, you know, like our next few moves sort of thing. And one of the things that I was talking about was like, I'm not really in love with my business anymore. And I want to do something a little bit more with my life. And this thing on YouTube seems interesting. Maybe I'll interview entrepreneurs and their success rides. And I did about five episodes of that, ran out of friends with cool cars that were willing to tell their stories. <laughs> and I found out it was very expensive to capture that content, edit it and put it out there for the amount of views that you're getting. There's no ad revenue coming in at all. It was like all out of pocket yeah. expenses. So I would start like filling in videos with ideas, like how I would hire people with parties or how I would use lawyers in my business sort of thing. And I would talk about some stuff and those would get some views. And then one day I remember I saw this comment and, and somebody that was watching a bunch of my videos, you know, said something along the lines of, you should do a video on the kind of women not to date. I was like, okay, cool. You know, I'll just like, I'm looking for something to make content on. So I talked about some personal experiences and some lessons that I learned there. And that was the first time that I saw a video do a hundred thousand views in a week. Most mm. of my videos were doing like a few hundred views or a thousand views. Like I would be surprised to see something crack a thousand views. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. That that's obviously a problem that people have here on YouTube. Maybe I should talk more about that. And then I remember doing like, like I was driving back and forth from the office because the office actually moved further away from where I lived because I wasn't spending so much time in it, but I would go in once a week and I would just put my GoPro on the windshield and I had about an hour of driving there and an hour driving back. And I would just make videos driving to work and driving home. Yeah. And you still um, do that, but just different topic. Yeah. Like, you know, like I'm driving different places now. I'm not driving to the office, but it basically started with me, you know, going to the office and I would just be like, okay, like I would look at the comments and somebody would ask me to solve a certain problem. And it's like, okay, clearly people are struggling with this. And then now, I mean, you know, today you can go to Google Trends, you can see what people are searching for. There's certain um, like software plugins you can get in Google Chrome to see what, what people use YouTube for. And you can kind of game the algorithms a little bit, like you can structure content in such a way that it'll capture the attention because you have to look at YouTube as a recommendation engine, right? Like it's going to recommend, recommend you and I to, to new viewers that need to see us or right. see our content on the things that we talk to. All I have to do is make sure I've got a compelling thumbnail and title and that the content that I deliver is going to be useful. And I mean, if you can master those things, then it's a great way to build an audience and build a company of one and talk to people that want to hear what it is that you want to talk about. Yeah. You know, what's funny is I tried to copy you or I tried to R&D you uh, mm -hmm. with, with the, the putting the, uh, the phone with the, mm -hmm. like I, I had this suction cup thing I put yeah. on my windshield. 
And so I'm like, you know, I'm, this is when I was renting space from Kiyosaki. This and is I'm, the, this is the GoPro that I use in the car. Oh, right see, now. that's the secret. Right that's the yeah. secret. So yeah. I was trying that's to use my cell right phone there. and I'm like, you know, it takes me 10 minutes to get into the office. I might as well use that to do another video. Yeah. So at the time I had a, I had an AMG GTS. Yeah. And the suspension on those things are, are, are Hard brutal. And it's loud. Yeah, yeah. So I was trying to do it with my phone, but it was like shaking the whole time. I'm like, yeah. Rich has got to have some secret. So, so I only did like three or four of them. And I tried it with my McLaren as well, but I, I had the same issue. You know what? I bought the McLaren and I wanted to do videos in it, you know, to sort of run it through the business sort of thing. But the car's so damn loud. The only time yeah. I can make videos in it is that when I'm in comfort mode and I'm just cruising somewhere quietly. Because yeah. like even the carbon tub, like when you drive over gravel, it's like, <laughs> it's like making all this kinds of noise and stuff. So yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of a system to making videos in your car and it's not as easy as you think. Like I threw away probably two out of three videos that I made. Like I only mm. published maybe like one out of three. And now today I probably publish everything that I make because I got so good at it. But for the longest time, like there was a lot of stuff that I was, you know, like this is the newest one that I, I, I got. I had a GoPro Hero 3, which started, which I had a lav mic, which would go to my seatbelt, which right. worked good enough. But this is the one that I use today. This is a, a nine or a 10. I don't know. Um, yeah, but a GoPro mounted to your windshield solves the bouncing around problem and you get some decent audio with it that way. I got to remember that. That's the secret. So yeah. one... Uh, kind of final thing I wanted to touch on here. And uh, you were mentioning in your course, the importance or how to set up a network. Yeah. This is something that I never did. And, and uh, another big mistake that I made as an entrepreneur, I always wanted to do everything myself. And mm -hmm. I just really didn't care about setting up relationships or, or getting to know people in the industry. It was just all seemed like a waste of time to me. And, uh, now, I'm, we'll, we'll go back here. When I started doing the Rebel Capitalist show, uh, I took a, a much different approach. And just because I was being more myself and just being extroverted and just trying to meet people that I thought were, were fascinating and talk to them. And so as a result, I, got, I was able to interview Kiyosaki. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I interviewed Kiyosaki the first time, you know, I didn't know him from Adam. But I was like, wow, this is, this is really, really cool that because I set up this podcast, I now have the opportunity to kind of discuss business and branding with mm -hmm. this guy that's just an absolute legend. Mm -hmm. And so after I interviewed him, we talked for maybe, geez, probably two or three hours, something like that. And mm -hmm. then as a result of interviewing other people and just being more open to setting up a network and the value there, I, I went and had dinner with Kiyosaki, and then he introduced me to Kenny McElroy. Mm -hmm. And then Kenny McElroy introduced me to all these other people. And then through uh, you know, the, the show and the podcast and the whiteboard videos, you know, I reached out to Rolo. And then I was able to connect Rolo with Kiyosaki. Mm -hmm. And now they've done quite a bit of content. I think they just did a class at like ASU the other day with Kenny. And okay. then uh, as a result of that relationship, then uh, I think you were able to do something with Kiyosaki. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it, and this is just one part of the network. You know, I've, I've been able to do that with guys yeah. in the and gals in the macro space and finance and hedge fund managers, but it's become a very, very key component in the, sec in the success that I've had with the yeah. show and the YouTube channel. And I look back at, as an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm just like punching myself saying, why didn't you do that? You know, why were you so damn stubborn before when now it's not only a benefit to the business, but it's a benefit to my life where I have all these really exciting, interesting, intelligent people that are part of that network that, you know, forget the YouTube and the podcast, but just going out to dinner and, and you know, having mm -hmm. an intellectual conversation with these people it's just very, very satisfying. So you it's know, so valuable. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? hundred percent. Let me tell you a funny story because uh, I had a revelation in the fall. So I got introduced to Robert Kiyosaki through you um, at some point last year, and I did a podcast with him. And shortly after that, like a day or two after I had to pick up my car from the McLaren dealership. So I've got a McLaren 720S for those of you that don't know, and I'm, and I'm driving it, the phone rings. And I answer it and it's kind of broken up and I can barely hear him. 
and it's Robert Kiyosaki calling me, right? He's like, Hey, you know, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to be on your podcast. And I enjoyed it. And it's like, you know, like I'm hearing some of it. Yeah. But, and I'm like, Robert, I can barely hear you, but is this a number that I can reach? And I'll give you a call back later. And, you know, we'll, we'll chat. And he's like, yeah, yeah, sure. No, no problem. And I got off the call and I'm like, I had this moment where I had to kind of like sit for a sec. Cause I'm like, I'm driving a McLaren 720S and Robert mm-hmm. Kiyosaki is calling me on my phone to thank me for doing the podcast episode. I'm like, yeah, how, yeah. how, like, how awesome is that? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, to the point of the network. Um, so a buddy of mine, Jason Gaynard, you know, he runs these masterminds and he, uh, I don't know if he came up with this term, but he's a person that I heard it from first. And he says, your network is your net worth. Right. Essentially, like we could be stripped of everything, the cars, the money, everything, the computers, the phone, but you could drop you or I in a foreign country somewhere. And as long as I have, you know, my contact list, you know, like my network, I could make it work. I could probably solve any problem very quickly, make money very quickly, because truthfully, if you don't have a good network, then you don't have a net worth. A lot of people just focus on making the money and put it in the bank and they, you know, squirrel it away sort of thing. But you have to, as you're, as you're building a business, as you, as you become a man, you know, worth your salt, sort of speak, as they say, you're going to have to build a good network. And, you know, like networks are great for so many phenomenal things. Like I build a course, which solves problems when it comes to entrepreneurship. I look at my contact list. I'm like, well, I know this guy, George Gaiman. We've talked many a time. Yeah, He's great probably example. got an audience that's very similar to mine. So I reach out to you and I say, hey, you know, do you want to you want to have a conversation about this course that's going to help entrepreneurs, you know, get their business off the ground and do the right things. You're like, absolutely. Right. So it's like having a good network is very, very useful. Um, You definitely want to build that as you're building your business because you will have to tap into it. And there's any number of things that you can use. I think that one of the most useful ones that I use, but it's a little bit wokeified now is entrepreneurs organization. I don't know if you're ever a a member of that. No, I know. What is that? It's a very good organization. They've got chapters worldwide. I don't know what the total member count is, but in any large city, you're going to find 130 to 160 members. Like in Toronto, I think they had 150 members. Was oh, that the time. EO? They just shortened. EO. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Kenny and Hartman. I think Kenny is still a member. Kenny McElroy. Yeah, yeah. Scottsdale. And I yeah. think Hartman, Jason Hartman, is another guy that I do a mastermind with. Uh, yeah. He was a member of that as well. And, and, and all of those organizations will then introduce you to um, events, speakers. Like we had this one event where we did this retreat with Vern Harnish, right? And that was a cool day. Like, you know, you're sitting at a, a dinner table with Vern Harnish, like, holy shit, like, that's awesome. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a guy called Yannick Silver who runs these uh, business retreats for entrepreneurs. And I got invited down to drive um, a, a challenge car off-road in Baja for 600 miles with like, 12 or 16 other entrepreneurs. I can't remember the total count mm. um, for about six days. And that was awesome. And I only got that invite because I knew somebody in a network that connected me with somebody else that was a car guy that also facilitated retreats for business owners. And it's like, that's that's a total write-off. I can do that, right? So as you grow your business, you don't want to, you know, stay in it and fully, you know, cocoon yourself. You, like I'm an, I'm an introvert. I know watching this, you're probably like, shut up, Rich. You know, you're talking too much. You're not an introvert, but I am. <laughs> I actually prefer the company of myself, but I, but I love being around other entrepreneurs. Like I like being, you know, in an opportunity, like being in a place where you can have an opportunity to have cool conversations with interesting people that have done cool stuff. The stories are always so amazing to listen to. So yeah, definitely. Like as you build a business, build your network because it is, it is more valuable than you think. And you've got a whole portion of the, the course allocated to that? Yeah, there's uh, your network. Developing your network is a, uh, a lecture in there for sure. Where is it? It's uh, it's about halfway through. There it is. Yeah. yeah. All right, buddy. Well, I know we've gone about uh, 45 minutes or so. We're going to leave it there. And, uh, you know, as you were saying earlier, uh, as a result of me being in, in your network, you just, I think, DM me on Twitter and said, hey, you want to be an affiliate for this and talk about it? And I said, yeah, done. Absolutely. No problem. And uh, as my viewers and listeners know, I, I don't really do affiliate stuff. I don't do sponsor stuff. I, I did a couple when I first started the channel, but I haven't done one in probably a year and a half. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's just a, a pleasure to have you on and it's a pleasure to promote the product. So we'll put That's a true. link in the description below if people want to uh, check it out. And then for others who want to find out more about what you do, where can they go? Um, I would just go to my YouTube channel, Entrepreneurs in Cars. And just as a heads up, the course is open for enrollment right now. It's April 27th, but it closes 
on the 30th. So uh, this Saturday, April 30th, it closes for enrollment. So if you want to get in, definitely get in now. Okay. And uh, and so the YouTube channel, is your website the same? Entrepreneurs in Cars, or you can go to my other website for um, my book and my supplement line, which has a, a contact page, which is theunpluggedalpha.com. Okay. Rich, thanks for the conversation, man. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, George. Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Do you enjoy watching these interviews I do for the Rebel Capitalist Show? Well, if so, you would absolutely love Rebel Capitalist Live. This is the conference I do twice per year, and we've had speakers like Robert Kiyosaki, Lynn Alden, Rick Rule, Jeff Snyder, and Dr. Ron Paul, just to name a few. So go to rebelcapitalistlive.com and check out the next event we have scheduled in Miami.